Listen, congratulations. Thank you. I don't care what the rest of the world thinks. Congratulations on Kill Me Three Times. Thanks very much, Jim. <laughs> well, we'll get into that in a minute. Just firstly, in a nutshell, describe Kill Me Three Times for us. Uh, Kill Me Three Times is a blackly comic, neo-noir, sun-scorched thriller set in a uh, surf town called Eagle's Nest. And it concerns the story of Charlie Wolfe, a hitman who's sent to uh, basically kill a young woman called uh, Alice um, and ends up uh, getting a lot more than he bargained for. And finish this sentence for us. In the tradition of... In the tradition of... I don't know. In the tradition of... Actually, in in the tradition of... Classic 80s exploitation films. <laughs> <laughs> you have gone for a very strong genre piece in this. Yeah. Why? Well, it was um, just a great uh, chance for me to do something completely different to my last film, which was a film called Red Dog. Um, and after doing Red Dog, I got offered a lot of dog scripts, <laughs> a lot of dog movies, and I ne- didn't necessarily want to go down that path. Uh and this script came across uh, my table, and I just loved it because I thought it was very cleverly written. Uh, it already had some really great cast attached to it. Um, I'd met the producer, Larry, uh, a year before, and we kind of got on well. And uh, I just felt, look, this is great. This is the, exactly the right kind of thing I'm looking for, something that's a little bit left of centre. And a bit fun. And fun, it's exactly. A fun film. With a capital F, yes. Was this <laughs> film originally intended to come out straight to DVD, or was it initially tagged as a theatrical release? Um, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, it was, to be honest, it was originally intended to be a theatrical release, but, um, that, the film was financed about three years ago and the landscapes changed quite dramatically in that time. Yeah. Um, I think the actual film exhibition apparatus is actually being dismantled and Mm. something else is being built in its place. Uh, and this film is kind I think it's, this audience for this film isn't actually one that goes to the cinemas anymore. It's uh, it's it's the audience that it has is out there, but it's in a it's in a different form. I think it's a mid range um, appeal, yeah. I guess you could say. And there's nothing wrong, is there, Criff, about a film coming out straight to DVD? The term straight to DVD <laughs> is often used as a as a pejorative term. It's not necessarily the case, or even always the case. Um, well, I wouldn't even call it straight to DVD, because it's actually being released on a number of platforms, and essentially on VOD, which is actually, to me, a very exciting um, arena to be um, working in, because, as I said before, there's an audience for this film, and a huge audience for it. And I think um, what's great about E1's strategy is that uh, it's it's really about accessing that audience directly and giving them what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. That really is a future, isn't it? VOD. Yeah. VOD Streaming. Slash, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, slash cinema release. Yeah. But can I just ask you, as a filmmaker, and I ask this of a lot of filmmakers, in an ideal world, you would like your film initially to come out in cinemas on a big screen before it goes elsewhere? Can I be totally honest with you? Please. Um, I really, for this... for. For this particular film, no, because I don't think, I, and I mean that in practical terms, I really don't think, I don't want this film to play in a cinema with five people in it, which is kind of what tends to happen with a lot of Australian films or a lot of films that are released uh, that, that aren't either for baby boomers or that aren't tentpole films. Um, and I, to me, a screen is a screen. You know, a screen is a relative thing. And everyone now has their home cinemas. Everyone's got iPads. Everyone's got iPhones. I, you know, I love film. I love seeing films on the big screen. But to me, it's more important that the film gets seen and enjoyed. And uh, it's like music. You know, we can listen to music with ear, I, iPhone earbuds or we can listen to it with a stereo. It's still music. And the joy you get out of listening to something is the same. And I think it's the same with movies. Now, I know you're an honest guy. And I know you're going to be honest with me. But I am going to call you out right now to please be as honest as you can. I cannot... Look, I enjoy this movie. I cannot connect the film that I saw with the reviews that I've read. (laughs) What... The film is not just being... It's being hated on. What is going on? What is wrong with film critics today? Oh, look. Film critics, you know, they're... 
feel sorry for them. <laughs> they just want to be filmmakers, and that's the difference. I'm making films, they're not. And ultimately, that's where I stand on it. And look, everyone's entitled to their opinion. And also, you've got to realise, you know, when you make a film, when you make anything, it goes with the territory. You're going to get criticised. And I think, you know, people... This film um, is unashamedly fun. It's unashamedly derivative. It, 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 it really wears its influences on its sleeve, um, knowingly. Uh, it's not. It's not embarrassed about that. Um, it's got its tongue very firmly placed in its cheek, and if you don't get that, then you're never going to get it. So you either come on board or you don't. And I can't really um, worry about who doesn't come on because I'm proud of the movie. I know who I made it for. I know why I made it, and I got a lot out of making it. So to me, it's all relative. And uh, you know, I as I said, it, it goes with also. the territory. <laughs> Can I put it to you also, Chris? Then is that of one of the one of the regrettable things about the internet is the proliferation of people who believe they can write. Some say that the internet is responsible for the proliferation of film critics. I counter that and say no. What you're seeing is the proliferation of bad writers. And what is happening is that a lot of young people with no experience try to make up or compensate for that lack of experience with arrogance. So and with that is coupled a follow-the-leader mentality. So if a film starts getting bad reviews, they will latch onto that, go into overdrive, and write on their blog or their whatever, mm. Mm. whatever platform they're on, something that is pretty much in line with what they're reading, but done in an exaggerated way. What do you think about that? Well, I agree. I think, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. It's a bit like, you know, ultimately, it's the way children act in the school ground. You know, if there's a weak someone who shows some weakness or if someone starts picking on someone, you know, the, it, the, the mentality is or the behaviour is to follow that and, um, you know, tar, tar that person with the same brush continually. So, you know, I think it's kind of immature. And ultimately, you know what? I really don't have time to read all of that stuff. And ultimately, it's just noise. And but, it's just, it just becomes static. Yeah. From a filmmaker's point of view... Why do you go with digitally exploding a car rather than actually exploding a car? Just give us the economics of it, Griff, because I'm watching the film and my one regret was, can't we really blow cars up anymore? Do they have to be done digitally? Well... What are the savings? I mean... Well, it's not, not so much a saving. It was more that where we were shooting was actually, um, you know, it was uh, quite um, a sensitive area in, for the Indigenous community. Uh -huh. And it was a special area, and you know, I think it would have been disrespectful to blow up a car <laughs> on what was probably a very sacred site. So, 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 so digital <laughs> desecration is okay because it doesn't actually happen. No, that's right. <laughs> so that was ma the main reason, and um, yeah, we actually we did one of the explosions is for real, um, and one of them is digital. So yeah, so you get the best of both worlds. Can I ask you a couple of red dog questions? Sure. We've got blue dog coming out when. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure, but sometime in 2016. Right. I don't know yet. We That's all kind of, that's out of my hands. What did the success of Red Dog teach at the Australian film industry? Ah, uh, okay. I think I think it taught, I think it showed people that, look, there are audiences um, that go and see Australian films in great numbers. Um, it's okay to be commercial. <laughs> it's okay to be corny. It's okay to uh, do something that, uh, you know, ap appeals to a broad market, a broad audience. And I think it also showed that you can do that and also deliver something with integrity and with quality. That, Criff Stenders, unashamedly commercial, unashamedly popular, unashamedly corny, that there is a triple backhander to cultural cringe in this country, <laughs> isn't it? I guess so. But, you know, I think, I, I, look, I love Australian movies. I love Australia. I love making movies here. We've got a great history, uh, um, and we've got fantastic filmmakers here, and I just love um, being part of that, you know, and uh, being inspired by, you know, our past. And, and Red Dog was very much a, a, you know, it was a love letter to all the films that um, Nelson and I grew up with. Uh, and uh, it was really nice to be able to kind of um, go there and, and, and not be, yeah, not be embarrassed about it. Just a question in parenthesis. 
when is cultural cringe going to evaporate? Because I'm now hearing young filmmakers and young actors and actresses complaining about the fact that they have to deal with it as well. When are we going to lose this this insecurity about doing stuff that's big and popular and and appealing to a big audience? Well, I think I think it's going to be generational. I think it's beginning to change. I, I would like to think it's changing. I think you know, and even what we were talking before about the way you know. Um, film distribution's changing. Um, you know, I think this new generation of filmmakers that are coming out are much more aware of the world around them in terms of the fact that, uh, you know, there's a lot of product out there uh, and there's a lot of way for that product to be seen. And um, I'm hopeful that, you know, there'll be, there'll be, you know, films and film culture that will continue to thrive and develop and grow in these new areas and hopefully break down a lot of that cringe. How does making films like Boxing Day and Illustrated Family Doctor help make a film like Red Dog? Do you need to make films like that to get to a Red Dog? Yes, I think you do. I think you do. I think it's it's, it's a cool, it's called experience. <laughs> And I think you learn just as much out of your failures and your mistakes as you do out of your successes. Um, and I think all f filmmakers, um, all good filmmakers, I think all great filmmakers, I wouldn't call myself a great filmmaker, but all good filmmakers are always learning and always evolving and always developing. Um, and, you know, I'm very proud of all the films I've made. Um, and each one of them has been a chapter in my life and each one of them has had a different result. And I've learned from that result, you know. Um, in, in fact, I think failures are actually more important to have because they actually galvanise you and they actually keep you going forward. Um, so it, to me, it's, 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 it's a journey and I'm, I'm, I'm still on it. I love Family Doctor so much. I know it's oh, a small thank you. audience, but that's your David Lynch movie. Yeah, it's well, it was yeah. It's look, uh, it was my ch look. I love the book. Um, I really made that film, you know, from my soul, and uh, it was a great. It was, I, I loved the opportunity that I was given. Um, but thank you, you know, it was it was yeah, it was it was it was a, an indulgence. 